welcome. I'm Ariella Novak, director of the Jewish Community Relations Committee. Um, thank you for coming to our Fed Talks Israel tonight. The Fed Talks program has become Federation's signature series for bringing our community interesting and high-profile speakers. Before we start, please allow me a few moments to speak about Federation. You know, you guys all know about Federation's critical work in helping those in need, feeding the hungry, assisting the elderly, and building Jewish identity in children, in children, teens, and young adults. And it's true. This is what we do all day, every day, and it's extremely important work. We also strive to, ad we also strive to address the alarmingly increased need for communal response and advocacy surrounding anti-Semitism and bias in our community. Jewish Federation is the only organization that has the relationships with elected officials and law enforcement to ensure that when there are incidences of anti-Semitism or bias in our community, they are being dealt with swiftly and with ser the seriousness that they deserve. Since the Tree of Life tragedy in Pittsburgh, there have been many incidences in northern New Jersey, and Federation has been consulted in each and every one of them. In addition, Federation just hired a new Jewish Community Security Director, Jerry Dargan, who will be supporting other community organizations to work with law enforcement to ensure our safety. Now, I would like to introduce to you Seth Davis, Executive Director of Israel USA. Seth Davis brings the blend of Israeli startup nation approach with an American-born culture. Seth has been in the field with Israel in Greece, Germany, Puerto Rico, North Carolina, Florida, Northern California, and I'm sure other places as well. Founded in 2001, Israel Aid is an Israel-based international non-governmental organization. Since its inception, Israel Aid has worked in emergency and long-term development settings in over 47 countries. Drawing on an extensive roster of leading Israeli and international experts, the organization is in a unique position to design and implement high-quality, cost-effective, and innovative programming that fully reflects the immediate and long-term needs of populations affected by disasters worldwide. Israel Aid's mission is to save lives during a crisis and then change lives by actively supporting local and national decision makers as they build a sustainable tomorrow. Hi, good evening everybody. What a nice evening. Uh, thank you to Ariella and uh, Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. It's very exciting to be here. Um, it's actually a special evening for me tonight. I also have my mom here visiting from Israel, Terry Davis. She's here. Um, and it's very really exciting. It's the first time she joins me at an event. Um, <laughs> and part of what I'll talk about today is actually uh, when we made Aliyah, that's why my accent's like this, because I was born in the States, grew up in Israel, spent a few years in London, back and forth, so that, you know, gets my accent out of the way. But, uh, you know, growing up in Ashkelon for the last 10, 12 years, we've endured rackets and sirens and threats and deep, deep trauma. And you'll see in the presentation how those skill sets and know-how of what we've developed of dealing with trauma helps now people all over the world. So it's pretty fascinating how we've taken it from Ashkelon's Dort all over the world. Um, we're going to start with a short video. A um, couple words about myself. I'm the executive director of Israel USA. I've been in the nonprofit sector now for about 10, 12 years. I was with the Israel Tennis Center's Foundation for a while, if someone you know, Hashomer Chadash, uh, the Center for Entrepreneurial uh, Jewish Organization, other good nonprofits. And when I came out to the States about three, four years ago from Israel and my family, I really felt a growing disconnect between Jewish diaspora and Israel, and it's really an important cause to bridge our language and our culture together to stay a strong nation. So, and Israel is one of the solutions to this, and we'll talk about that tonight. Um, Israel is the largest humanitarian organization out of Israel. It was formed in 2001, over 17 years ago. People of goodwill saw people uh, in distress and just came together and started deploying and helping. 2010 was a major tipping point with Haiti, uh, one of the worst uh, devastations of our time. And that, at that time, the organization was really formed into a structure with employees. Um, and we use a lot of innovation and know-how from Israel to portray in the world. As I speak to you, we're in 19 countries in the world. So when Guatemala, when Mexico, Puerto Rico, Dominica, when Chico, California after the fires of uh, paradise, when uh, Greece and Germany, when Bangladesh helping the Rohingyas, when Nepal, Philippines, and many other locations in the world. Everywhere where we're based, we have usually an Israeli staff on the ground, 
And out of our 300 uh, global staff members at the moment, over 80% are local people. That include Kenyans and, believe it or not, Syrians and Iranian refugees that work for us. And everywhere in the world, we have local people to create sustainability, to teach them the tools. This is a picture of uh, just three, four weeks ago. We were on a mission with uh, Hispanic leaders of APAC, in fact. Uh, this is a, a, a gravity-based, off-grid, slow sand water system. It sounds very sophisticated. It is. We brought what's called WASH, water sanitation hygiene uh, engineers from Israel. They came to Puerto Rico, worked with local experts, and created a system that will always have safe water because in Patias, which is an hour and a half south of San Juan, people didn't have electricity for eight months. And I have to remind people, Puerto Rico is part of the USA. Um, so this system will give them sustainability forever. But it's not just a system, it's a holistic approach. We took people from the local Jewish community in San Juan, we taught them how to be wash, and, uh, wash ambassadors. So they learned the whole language of it. They went door to door and taught a lot of the low income elderly people living there that part of their illnesses are due to water. They didn't even realize that, that the, because they're drinking non-safe water, they were getting ill, and they taught them about hygiene and uh, sanitation. Uh, so we do this in a lot of places. Usually, we always hear about what we call cynically the aid festival. The first month, there's a lot of media frenzy. People volunteer from all over the world. We send food, we send clothes. When I, was, when I went to Chico a few months ago, you see 90% of it uh, just thrown on the wayside. It's not always what's needed. The recovery, the long-term recovery, takes years to build back, to make the community resilient, stronger. And I can tell you from experience from Ashkelon, people's trauma stays embedded for years. If you don't deal with it and give people tools to cope with it, it'll never leave people. I met a woman um, from Puerto Rico two weeks ago in Miami. She left Puerto Rico. She, every rainfall, she thinks it's a hurricane. She can't cope with it. What you see here is beehive. We've used the kibbutzim's know-how of creating honey and we've taken it over the world, teaching women uh, through a women's empowerment project, an income uh, generating project. They make their own honey and then they sell it and it brings them together. Um, we call it child-friendly safe areas. It's in the world of protection, education of children. Art therapy, drama therapy, music therapy. A lot of these therapeutic tools have been groundbreaking. When we made it to Japan, it's a very introverted uh, culture, you don't show emotions, it shows weakness. So actually enabling them to put their thoughts and their emotions on paper or through um, drama really let them uh, showcase what they were feeling and how they are. We actually have a fellowship. Uh, we send every year 15 fellows. Uh, they join our teams on the ground, Jews and non-Jews together. And this is a picture I took in Germany this summer where she was helping uh, refugee children uh, to be more stable and resilient. Uh, the other thing is medical. You know, Israel is a leading uh, medical research and solutions in the whole world. And we send medical staff from physicians, dentists, and they go, and it's not just about a treatment, it's about capacity building. How do you help the local community work in more efficient ways, best practices, which equipment, and how do you build that relationship between them? Here you see a dentist from the Bay Area that went a few months ago. So when you look at this picture, you have to blink a second. Something looks off. Yes, there is kind of a ship on a house. That's what happened there. It was a terrible, terrible uh, devastation. Our global co-CEO, Yotam, went there for a month, ended up staying for three and a half years. And we actually set up Israel, Japan. Many of the countries we go, we set up a local uh, NGO to collaborate with government agencies. Today, Israel, Japan actually raises money for other disasters around the world, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, this is Sierra Leone. The Ebola outbreak was really scary. People thought it could be a global epidemic. They thought a lot of people would be affected. It was contained. Still 10,000 people lost their lives. When we arrived to Sierra Leone, there was one social worker in the whole country. They didn't understand the concept of social workers and helping people. Uh, and today there's 240 social workers. We received an award a few months ago by the president for educating them on the importance of social workers and mental health experts. This is Nepal. Israel, with the IDF rescue unit, together with Israel, found the last living person five days after the earthquake. And our global co-CEO, actually, who speaks Nepalese, was put down into this very narrow hole, and he found the last living person who they're still friends with until today, when everyone lost hope. 
And here they are in the picture you could see together. 2015 was probably the worst refugee crisis of that time. Um, hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing Syria and Iran, families slaughtered, Yazidis, Iranians, and um, the last person they expected to see from that little four-mile shore when they were coming from Turkey to Greece were Israelis. So they came to the shore, and just imagine this, they see shirts with a big star David and the Israeli flag. That's the joke. They think they got to Ashdod or Haifa. They're like, we took the wrong boat. And then they start hearing people speaking Arabic with the shirts, so they're totally confused. What's going on here? But what we really did is we, we were the only international NGO able to deploy Arab-speaking medical staff, which included Israelis, Israeli Arabs, and Palestinians working hand-in-hand -hand to be the organization helping them when they're first on scene and, and helping them with the next steps as they went to refugee camps and then made it to inland. For a long time, they were going to Germany. The borders have been shut down. Now they're being integrated into Greece, into society there. And we're still there. There's a raft that arrives every two days. Back then, it was 50 rafts a day. A lot of people lost their lives. The, they were putting too many people, a pearl raft. Life jackets were fake. People were taking advantage of the situation. Um, nowadays, we're still the only organization there helping them and doing the work with them. And actually, the nurses that work for us are all refugees, the people who have this background. The U.S. also uh, suffers from a lot of hurricanes and disasters. Um, we started this back with Katrina, and we've been sending veterans from the Israeli army to work with veterans of America to build back homes. So it's something very unique, this bond between veterans. I recall from my childhood uh, when I had a, a moment with my grandfather. He was one of these tough Brooklyn guys, you know, but when he saw I went to the Israeli army, it was the first time he was able to share a lot of his World War II army stories. So it creates the bond. Same thing here. With people appreciate each other. We work together hand in hand. We had teams from Israel for 10 months in Texas building back homes. Mexico, we still have people in Morales building back uh, a whole program with the Ministry of Education in schools for dealing with mental health. And I'll show you a short video. So one of the main messages we're trying to get across the whole humanitarian landscape is it's not just about the disaster response and the emergency. It's actually about long-term recovery and resiliency. This is the value proposition of ISRAID. So we call it Philo. It's first in. We were first on the ground in Puerto Rico and Haiti, even before the U.S. government. But we're also one of the last to leave. So we stay for years. We're already in Puerto Rico a year and a half in Dominica. Uh, we're in Mexico, Guatemala, we've been in the Philippines for five years, Japan we were six, and Haiti we just closed a year ago after about eight years. So this builds, it takes time. You come, you, the way it works is you go and you try to, you collaborate with other organizations. Who's doing what, where, and when? Where's my expertise? Where can I help build back this community? So let's say Israel's expertise is mental health, medical, water-related, livelihood. So we see which communities are not being helped. We start deploying the professionals there. We put staff and we build back. And now in Puerto Rico, 
we built this water system, people say, wow, this is amazing. So this took a year and a half. Now people want to do five more in other communities that have the same issue. These things take years till it's in the community and people want to scale it up to a whole nation. So that's why it takes years to build the trust, adapt to the culture, hire local people that learn the tools and make it sustainable over time. This is uh, us six months ago, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, gave Israel the award for the leading NGO of 300 organizations helping integrate refugees from the Middle East into society. 70 years after the State of Israel and the Holocaust, we're being awarded in Germany for this. Sierra Leone, I spoke about before thanking us. And just a month ago, President Clinton in Puerto Rico thanking Israel for the work in Puerto Rico and Dominica. So I know a lot of you are at the edge of your seats at this stage and want to see how can I help, how can I volunteer, how can I make a change in the field. There's many ways. So first thing, if you're a professional or you know a professional, if you're a doctor, dentist, social worker, nurse, engineer, a mental health expert, we call that a professional volunteer. You could sign up for a roster and when there's a disaster in a certain area, we contact you and say, would you be willing to join us for 10 days, 20 days, longer, etc. If you're like me, you're not one of those, but you're still a nice person and good-hearted and want to help. So you could sign up to build people back into their homes. We have anyone from age 80, uh, uh, all those volunteers, 92 last year. We help people, what's called mucking out homes. People not insured, they lose all, everything they own and FEMA won't build, them back to, won't build the houses back until this work is done. I joined teams in North Carolina, Florida in the summer. Um, it's one of the most uh, rewarding things. We always say it's about the beneficiary. We're trying to help people, but let's be honest with ourselves, we're really helping ourselves when we volunteer and we feel better and stronger with ourselves. Um, I'll share a small story. This is actually me here in the middle in the gear, mucking out homes. I have zero experience in construction. My wife makes fun of me. I could barely put a nail on the wall. So a, a small story. We're in this house uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, three of a five room were totally decimated. You try to save whatever's left and you clear up the room so then FEMA could build it back. This woman tells us no one answered me. I've been trying for a week contacting everybody. She's a single mother with a 12 year old daughter. Um, we start talking. She's never met an Israeli or a Jewish person in her life. And, and we're, we're doing our work and you come 10, 12 people, you get done in three hours what could take a single person four weeks. Even and they don't have the gear and the know-how, it could take even longer. Tanji comes with this request and you could look in the background, a lot of the trees fell over and they're bare. It's like, I really need you to replant this tree. It means a lot to me. If you'd be willing to try, it would really make me feel so good and it's really important to me. So we talked amongst ourselves, it's not something we usually do, we're ready to go to the next house. We saw it really, really mad at her. So we came together and we start pulling this tree with the rope from different angles. You know, we didn't really know how to do this, but we're pulling this tree and we're working this for about 20 minutes and totally sweating. And eventually we're able to replant this tree. We look back, we see this woman jumping up in joy and hugging her 12 year old daughter. We're wondering why, and she says, you just don't understand. This tree I planted 14 years ago when my son died of a rare illness, and this is the hope we have in life and the sign of growth. So it's little moments like that when you never know how you're touching somebody's life and, you know, rebuilding their life. We talked about capacity building, professional volunteers. So the dentists are going to Kenya. There's 250,000 refugees in Kakuma four dental clinics for this whole area and no one wants to take ownership of it and a few Kenyan dentists that don't have all the knowledge and know-how. So at the moment with Henry Shine together we're recruiting dentists and we're sending them on missions of two weeks and they're helping the Kenyan dentists to learn best practices, add equipment, build up and then they stay in touch with teleconferencing and it helps all the people. Another thing is the fellowship I spoke about. We're now, we just finished, uh, we closed our third fellowship, but if you have uh, kids or grandkids or people you know in the community that want to do a two-month experience hands-on with our teams in the ground, we send them, and for a whole year they're committed to speak about it in the community and campus. <coughs> this is our, our la last fellowship uh, together uh, at DC. The other two things is we do a lot of events. We talk about a lot of aspects. We talk about long-term recovery. We talk about how Israeli know-how 
is creating a paradigm in the whole humanitarian landscape because our technologies and know-how to deal with water, our, our, our methodologies we've developed of dealing with mental health, recognizing the importance of mental health and knowing how to cope with it, our medical know-how, together with other professionals around the world, is really a gift to the nations, it's a light to the nations, and it's part of our Jewish values. Like this is, you know, this is what, what we care about, so this is what we want to do. Um, we talk about this on campuses. We've never had a BDS protest against us, obviously. Um, we actually try to build coalitions through this and invite everyone in and show how we're helping in Africa and in Philippines and other countries and show the positive side of Israel. Um, we also have a teen curriculum that could go to any youth movement or school, supplementary education. It's two lesson plans about refugee crisis and disaster plan. I've done it a few times in classrooms. I leave with tears in my eyes every time. The teens are so engaged about being global citizens and are hungry to find why they're proud of Israel and what they're doing in the world and how it connects them through everybody. It's two lesson plans. You just be downloaded from our website. It's free. And the educators have videos and it's very easy to amplify um, in the school scenario. Paradise, California was a devastating, uh, horrific um, devastation. I was there. It was all basically in ashes. Um, they knew it was coming, but it was pretty quick, so a lot of people were able to run down the hill, but people with disabilities, some older people didn't think it was real threat. They wanted to protect their homes, just stayed in their homes. And um, So 500 children moved to Chico, the nearby city, but all the educators, Boys and Girls Club, it's a huge youth movement, had zero training in mental health and how to cope with it. The own educators couldn't cope with it. Some of them are in their mid-20s. Uh, we sent a whole team that's still on the ground helping build that capacity within the organization. We also took the police officers that were working 24-7 for a few weeks after and did training for them for their self-care so they could take a moment, take a deep breath, think what they went through and how to deal with that. I'm going to show one last video and then uh, I'll be happy to take questions. <laughs> מאז קידמנו ברחבי העולם את השנה האזרחית החדשה. וכולנו, כולנו עדיין מלאי ציפיות משנת 2019. היושבים באולם הזה יודעים ש-2019 מביאה איתה חוץ מציפיות ותקוות כמה נושאים דחופים שחיי אדם תלויים בהם. צונאמי שייקה בחופי אינדונזיה, סופה טרופית בפיליפינים, וחורבן שיצרו שריפות הענק בקליפורניה, הם רק חלק מאסונות הטבע שהתרחשו בחבר... ברחבי העולם בחודשים האחרונים. הקטסטרופות האלה השאירו אחריהם משפחות וקהילות שלמות במחסור ואובדן. האירועים העצובים האלה נשמעו לעתים כי בעיות גדולות מדי ורחוקות מדי. רחוקות מהעין ולכן גם רחוקות מהלב. אך לא זו התחושה אצל הנשים והגברים שיושבים כאן היום. ישראייד, למשל, ארגון הומניטרי ישראלי שנציגיו נמצאים כאן, פועל בכל אחד מהמקומות שהזכרתי עכשיו. מגיש עזרה לנפגעי הצונאמי, עוזר בפינוי השטחים השרופים בקליפורניה, ומכשיר מתנדבים מהארץ ומהעולם במתן עזרה הומניטרית לאזורים מוכי אסון. מי היה מאמין? לפני שבעים שנה מי היה מאמין שחזינו בפלא שנקרא מדינת ישראל קורם אור וגידים שיום אחד המדינה שלנו הקטנה הצעירה והמוקפת מתנגדים וגם אויבים תהיה חזקה ומפותחת מספיק כך שתוכל לשתף ידע הון אנושי ופיתוחים טכנולוגיים עם מדינות אחרות ברחבי העולם. 
I like to end with this message because I think it's very powerful. It's Israel's duty and the Jewish people's duty always has been to help anyone in need. And President Rivlin at the first ever Humanitarian Award a couple months ago, which they awarded Israel, acknowledged the work and I think portrays in a very beautiful way how it's a blessing to us that we could be proud of this work and we're doing it. And we don't do it for Hasbara or to, to, you know, to get accolades. We do it because we care first and foremost. Obviously, it does three things. Um, it does save lives, it does help build back communities, and it does bridge people. Because when I met the first ever Iranian I've met in my life, it was in the field in Greece, Ali. And then I met Suma in, uh, in uh, Germany, who's a social worker working for us, a Syrian one. And even uh, meeting people in North Carolina, and I met a Jewish person, an Israeli person in their lives. Um, it's just moments that bridge people, uh, people are people, and the more people we connect and tell the story, the place will be with less hatred, less anti-Semitism. Anti um, so to summarize, uh, Israel is the largest humanitarian organization. It's growing really, really fast. It's doubling itself every year. Uh, we also have a U.S. 501c3 and a board and a, with fiduciary responsibility and advisory council. We have three main programs in the U.S. The outreach, we do a lot of talks and explain to different audiences. Um, we have the lesson plans for teens, and we have the professional network and the general uh, volunteer network for people to join. When disasters hit the U.S., we're part of National VOAD, and we respond, and we're part of a whole group of people that respond. Internationally, we're usually first on scene, and then we assess if we stay long-term, and when we stay, we stay one of the longest. Um, so happy to hear any questions, and thank you for coming out this evening on your free night. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, please. So Larry asks, um, like when we go to remote places like Nepal, where does our staff get the food and the water and how do they sustain themselves? So I can share a story uh, in Dominica. It's an island that's not known very well. People think Dominican Republic, but it's not. It's Dominica. Uh, it's outside the USV Islands. It got the brunt, the eye of Maria, before hit Puerto Rico, and 95% of about a 70,000 population island was totally decimated. Um, luckily, people survived, but the houses, everything was destroyed. We sent teams there. There was actually a Jewish woman that owns a hotel and contacted uh, Global Co. CEO. And he had to look on the map. He thought, oh, Dominican Republic, that's what everyone says. And actually, no, there's an island called Dominica. And we sent teams there. There was no food, there's no infrastructure. People, food was actually dropped by helicopters the first few days, and they bathed and washed in the, in the river, in the sea. There was no other way to do it. So a lot of times you, you have to survive with the locals in the way the locals do. Um, I say a lot of times that's the advantage of sometimes being Israeli. We have that um, Israeli entrepreneurial SAS. So in the humanitarian landscape, it works. So for instance, in Indonesia, when we arrived, the president shut down the border, said, I don't want help from any humanitarian organizations. It had nothing to do with Israel. I just, I'm strong, we're resilient, we're the uh, largest Muslim country in the world, we'll, we'll be okay. A thousand people died. Thousands of people. So Israel, by the time he decided that, when other people were at the airport filling forms, Israel already was in a few small towns with local collaborations with NGOs working. So sometimes that is really, let's call it pushiness, is an advantage. So here it is. So same thing with the survival mode. To your question, people find ways to make it work. So that's kind of how we survive that. Thank you. Yes. So Susan asked, why don't people hear more about the story and it's used for us for our reasons? So we, we hear that a lot. Uh, we came to the U.S. in about 2013 with a major grant from the Koret Foundation for three goals. One, to tell the story more, to share the positive side of Israel and things we're doing in the world, to connect Jewish diaspora and the next gen to things they more uh, gravitate towards. And the third thing was basically to create a professional network also in the U.S. So that's what we're doing as we speak. People want to tell the news about conflict. So they want to hear... Um, like the bad story about the Arab and the Israelis sometimes. So sometimes when you tell the good story, it doesn't get as much press, to be honest. It's something we're working on. Um, so we're getting more and more. I'm sure now that you've seen the name today, you're going to start seeing it in many, many spots. Uh, I see the amount of press we're getting. It's a, it's a lot more. It's not mainstream CBNC or Fox yet, but it will get there with time. I think we're really growing fast, and it will grow into a an entity and it's growing into a movement, the more and more people deploy locally, it becomes a multiplier. The, they become ambassadors, they tell the story, then it will be told. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
So Alan asks how uh, the various NGOs from Israel coordinate who's doing what and we don't step over each other's toes and it's efficient. I would say even more than that, how do all the international NGOs and the local ones that exist coordinate? So usually in the States, there's FEMA and around the world there's the UN. Everyone comes to a big tent. Everyone shares what they know and what they could give and what resources they have. And then people define. In Puerto Rico, and we're thanked by a lot of people by this, I spoke at Somos on Sunday with the Council to Israel New York, Dani Dayan, at a main event there uh, of Puerto Rican government officials. We went to Patias. No one went to Patias. We found the most vulnerable community with the less resources, and we do a lot of times, and we want to help there. So that's kind of expertise. Within the Israel landscape, there's different organizations. Some focus just on water and remote areas. Some focus on um, food and catering for kids in Mumbai. Some, so the, it's, some do development for agriculture. Um, there's a, uh, most of the organizations are not humanitarian-based. There are a few, but usually there's enough work for everyone to do. Let's put it that way. There's 201 million people, as I speak now, in the world that are defined that need humanitarian aid this second, right now. Yeah, please. My name is Richard. I want to know what's your major source of funding? So, Israel Global today is about $10 million um, globally, and it doubled itself twice the last two years. So it's really been excelling fast. One of the biggest funders, and you're going to be rattled by this, is actually UNICEF, part of the UN, which is very surprising. Uh, but in the field, they're about helping children and saving lives, and they see us as an efficient, uh, great partner to do work. In South Sudan, which is the youngest country in the world from 2000, very, very dangerous, uh, where they're one of the biggest uh, partners, also in Dominica, which I mentioned before. World Bank has a major project with us for water in Vanuatu. It's a small island that got hit near the Fijis. Um, we get money from the Methodist Church, believe it or not. We get from the Mormons, a lot of uh, small donors, family foundations, and even JFNA. We're part of the JVOAD effort of the uh, Jewish federations of North America, especially with the local uh, crisis. Yes, please. So Larry asks a great question. Uh, how do we decide where we go to and how long we stay? And is the factor uh, money and or people? So I feel like you sat in like a headquarters three months ago when chairs were being thrown across the, the room because actually Israel made a very strategic decision where um, we're shrinking the number of countries we are at the moment from 19 to 12. The reason is we want to go deeper in the countries where we are with higher capacity. And it's hard because people that deploy to the seven other countries feel they're the most important, they need the most need. It does come down to manpower and funding. So the problem is most people fund the first month. When you see that big disaster, you send a check. No one thinks sending a check now to Puerto Rico a year and a half later, although it's still devastating in many areas. So it's very hard to raise long-term recovery funding. Um, what we're doing in the States now is because for 17 years we've built a roster of 2,000 professionals willing to volunteer and deploy at no cost. And a lot of people have done this multiple times. We, and we're now in more and more countries. People say, hey, I can't do this anymore. You know, I can't leave my clinic every time. We you know, have younger kids now. So by creating a roster in the U.S. to go with the Israelis hand in hand, we have more manpower. So that's how we're tackling manpower. And funding we're tackling also by having the U.S. presence, telling the story, approaching other agencies like USAID, like other funders, and that's how we plan to grow it. So Larry asks if someone makes a donation, does it go designate to a specific uh, disaster area or general? So Israel actually has designated funding. You could give, I want to give to Chico, I want to give to Puerto Rico. We also created three years ago an emergency fund. So many years ago we created a partnership with AJC. After every disaster they, they usually give us um, an initial seed grant which enables us to deploy quickly. Because before that we had to start calling those, can you give me money so I could fly some people, assess. Um, and then we're able to uh, do a campaign. We created an emergency fund three years ago that serves all the different emergencies. And then there's people that donate for the student fellowship or teen education or whatever it is. So, you know, it's a 501c3, there's a board, there's grant giving, there's audits. It's very, very high level fiduciary responsibility. Yes, please. So Jane asks, do we uh, deploy after what kind of disasters? Is it just natural? So first of all, it's natural man-made, because the example of the refugees in uh, Greece or Germany, it's man-made disasters, uh, and Rohingyas in uh, Bangladesh. Um, again, it's a harsh decision. It's like Larry asked before. So usually we go to mass-scale 
disasters, thousands of people, a whole city of paradise. So for instance, we didn't deploy in Pittsburgh, and we also only go when people want us or are willing to accept us, because we want to work with the community. In Pittsburgh, a lot of people went and they felt it was overwhelming and they needed time with themselves with their own resources. Now we're actually talking to the community, do they want us to work on mental health capacity building? Because they feel the trauma is deeper than they ever imagined it would be. Um, but for instance, Brazil, we didn't go now. There was 300 people killed. It's very sad and devastating, but it's not mass. It's not uh, thousands of people. It's not dozens of cities. So that's kind of where we're usually focused. Uh, please, yeah. Uh, Somali asks about how the water is being purified in Puerto Rico. So a little about water. So usually what happens, uh, the, the water, water is always contaminated after disasters. Um, it brings a lot of illnesses. A lot of people give out water filters. That's the first thing you do. So first thing we've discovered over years, when you go back to all these areas, you find the filters in people's cabinets because they don't even understand what's the importance of the filter. No one taught them how to screw it on. So the first thing Israel built over very fast, we learned... We go door to door and we screw it on for them and we explain to them the importance and we sit with them and talk to them. You don't want to enforce anything. You want it to be a collaboration. In Puerto Rico, we did something for the first time ever, actually, and it's a lot more robust. Usually we're about software, not hardware. We're about people and capacity building indirect to direct. So if we train uh, 300 educators, it impacts 4,000 students, for instance. So with the water system we built there, it's the same type of concept. We, we came up with the concept, if we did this big water filtration system, it could provide sustainability for this whole community of 1,400 people for hundreds of years if it's maintained properly. The system is gravity-based, so it comes... First of all, Patias, if anyone has been, or go Puerto Rico, it's one of the most beautiful places you'll see in your lifetime. It's, it's tropical, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. And the water comes down from the hills through the small rivers, and through physics, it goes back into this filter, this robust system we saw a picture before. And then it goes to what's a slow sand system. So it cleans it through a slow sand system, no electricity at all, totally off grid. And then it goes into another um, water filtration into the home. So that's kind of what it is. That's the system. It took seven months to build and three hundred thousand dollars so usually we don't do these kind of projects what's interesting is fema we just did a celebration a month and a half ago to launch it and we danced salsa with the local um citizens which they had to see my left foot which was embarrassing but you know you could always learn something and it was fun and it was a great day but it was to thank them to let us come to their community and, and work together to help and now FEMA sort of say, wow, this is a main system. I want to do five of these. FEMA is a $3 billion organization. If they decide to do it, they could do it. So, so it's kind of the proof of concept. It's that bringing that know-how that then becomes multiplied. Is, is this being used in Israel at all on a routine basis? Not as far as I know, because um, Israel doesn't have uh, grid issues in most places, um, as far as I know. Um, we also have solar solutions. We have other solutions in other places. I don't know about this. Uh, Jean asked about your name, Jean. Jean. Jean asked about food for food, food, food for the poor. For the poor, um, I haven't heard of it. I said before, like we have our areas of expertise. We usually don't deal with food or shelter. It's less our area. In the initial response, the first two to four weeks, we do uh, provide a lot of aid. A lot of organizations that raise aid, for instance, delivering good, partner us. They come to us, say, "You have boots on the ground. You know who's." You know, a lot of these countries sometimes there's corrupt issues, there's corruption, it doesn't get to the right people. So when you're on the ground and you're working and collaborating, people trust us and know us for many years. So they would send us, uh, it could be food or goods or vouchers, and a lot of times we distribute, but it's not our main focal area. So I don't, and last question? Yeah. So Larry asked how, how the local customs uh, influence the mental health in the community. Well, Legalities and provisions when you bring mental health people between countries, between states. Or oh, the know-how, the culture. Okay, culture, culture is the biggest, biggest gap everywhere. So that's why we usually hire local people and they help bridge that uh, culture gap by having local people also educate us quickly on the customs. Uh, we saw that in Japan. In Nepal, by the way, it's a country with one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Um, it had nothing to do with the earthquake. It, it was an epidemic that was happening in the country altogether. And actually, we talk about this. Sometimes disasters are opportunities. Today, we spoke about Tel Aviv being here. I remember living in Tel Aviv in 2012 was the second war, the first time the rockets made it to the center. 
it was the first time I met most of my neighbors and we had a conversation. So, and then you see them every week after that suddenly say, hello, how you doing? So it bridges people together in the most basic way. Same thing here in Nepal, by bringing after the earthquake the mental health experts, which was then accepted by society, and we found out for them what worked, by the way, was drama. Like they like to do a street, uh, they did street um, theater. It's amazing. Like they got out there and did these shows, and women showcased, like if, if they were being abused, they were trying to show the pain and the anger they had, uh, and kids were showing what they were missing. And then it became something across the whole country, which later was research actually helped reduce the suicide rate in Nepal. So that's why I talk about long term, because it doesn't always happen the first month or two months or three months. In Puerto Rico, we work with a local NGO called Aspira. It helps uh, uh, kids who are in very um, disturbed domestic homes and a lot of them are on the street, kicked out of the system. It's a really good NGO with small classrooms of 10 people and gives them more uh, technical and vocational training to succeed in life. Um, they had zero training in dealing with these devastations and disasters. Um, so we worked with them now for a year and a half in all their 35 schools. Now the Ministry of Education located in Puerto Rico and the First Lady are asking us to go to all schools. These things take time. You've got to prove a concept. You need local people advocating for you. People from Spiro are knocking on all the doors saying, hey, this should be in all schools in Puerto Rico. Let's make it happen. So I want to thank you for coming tonight. You're, you're a great community. I can feel the energy in the room. And you come out and you want to learn and you're proud Zionists. And uh, I thank you for that. And I hope it's the beginning of a long-term relationship. I look forward to hearing from you. You can take my card, be in touch. Um, and as uh, other people who are inspiring, who've been deployed all over the world, that you can meet. I'm based out in New York City. We have teams all over the country. And thank you again to Ariella and the whole team that did the hard work to put this together tonight. So thank you. Um, something that you mentioned, school, high school programming, and I can speak off script a bit. We were privileged enough to have uh, the, the Israel Aid uh, team come here for their first ever high school lesson. Um, and I'm, I worked with them and I'm still working with them on creating their lesson plan based upon our students. And for those of you who do not know, we have a program called I Can. It's teaching kids how to combat anti-Semitism, BDS, um, how to live a Jew Jewish life and be okay with that. Um, and it's amazing because we have both public school students and private school students coming from completely different backgrounds, yet they all relate on one thing, and that's the love and passion they have for Israel, and now their new friendships are born together. So we were privileged enough at one of our meetings, I, when I spoke with Israel and I knew I wanted to have Seth right away, I got on the phone and said, when can you come? Um, you can't say no to her, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and do you have anything for kids? And a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> so we were able and fortunate enough to have a speaker come, and these kids were blown away. And the one video that you sort of saw here and that you definitely spoke to, what, and the kids' eyes were just glued, they've never seen anything like this before, was exactly what you were mentioning, how they're literally just the, the Arabs, Israelis, Palestinians, they're standing on these cliffs. They don't know, they said, when these little raptors are coming with, the, with their life jackets. They don't know what time, they don't know when, but they just stand there waiting. And the, one of the questions somebody asked them is, well, how do you know they're coming? They just come, we know. And they wait there, and you see it's really powerful video. This one person said, don't touch me, don't touch me, or something like that, do not touch me, because why they're Israeli. As you were mentioning, they, they Star of David's on their shirt, and then eventually they, this guy realized, like, I'm so wrong for saying this. And he went back into his only little backpack he had and gave a cracker to the helper. And it's such a, and you saw, and I brought that to their attention. I said, you see here, they're two different backgrounds, but yet they're coming together. We're so fortunate with our ICANN group. We have the teams from both public and private school. I said, it's, it's similar and different, coming together. So it was a really powerful message. So I appreciate your company, your organization, being able to offer that to us here. So thank you.
would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.